Welcome to the Top Business Leader Show, powered by Rise 25 Media. We feature top founders, executives, and business leaders from all over the world. Chad Franzen here, co-host of the show, where we feature top restaurateurs, investors, and business leaders. This is part of our Spot On series. Spot On has the best-in-class payment platform for retail, and they have a flagship solution called Spot On Restaurant, where they combine marketing, software, and payments all in one. They've served everyone from larger chains like Dairy Queen and Subway to small mom-and-pop restaurants. To learn more, go to spoton.com. This episode is brought to you by Rise25. We help B2B businesses get ROI, clients, referrals, and strategic partnerships through Done For You podcasts. If you have a B2B business and want to build great relationships with clients, referral partners, and thought leaders in your space, there's no better way to do it than through podcasts and content marketing. To learn more, go to rise25.com or email us at support at rise25.com. Andrew Dana is co-owner and founder of Timber Pizza Company and Call Your Mother Deli. He's 1-0 in the boxing ring, 2-0 at starting restaurants, and decent on the golf course. Andrew is a brand new dad, proud DC native, and an encyclopedia of carbohydrate knowledge. And overall, a great guy. Andrew, thanks so much for joining me today. How are you? Wow, that was incredible. Thank Good. you. Good. Uh, how did you become interested in carbohydrates? Oof, man, I, you know, I've been a carbsman since before I can remember. So uh, growing up, my dad would go get bagels every Saturday. And I remember I would sort of eat, nosh on a bagel while I was thinking about my other bagels that I was going to have. So I would sort of have an appetizer bagel while I was like, okay, and this one's going to have melted cheese and this one's going to have peanut butter. So from as long as I can remember, I've, I've loved food, loved carbs. So it's just just been in me, I guess. Would you say, based on your knowledge and based on what you're, uh, what you hear, that carbohydrates get a bad rap? Hundred percent, hundred percent. Carbs, carbs give us energy. They're good for you. The guy who just won the New York Marathon, you know what he had for breakfast the day of the marathon? A bowl of oatmeal. Carbohydrates, people. Let's let's go. Come on. <laughs> so, uh, you know, you're a founder of two restaurants. How did you kind of begin your journey in the hospitality industry? Yeah, you know, I like had odd jobs in college and stuff like that. But, um, you know, I think the dream really started to grow when I was in grad school. So I went to Fordham to get my MBA focus in marketing. And, um, you know, while I was there, I was living in Brooklyn and just eating at these like world-class restaurants, just like not only is the food great, but the experience, the ambiance, everything's just top notch. And I was like, just really falling in love with the industry. So I actually wrote my capstone business school project on a pizza restaurant thinking like, oh, that'd be a fun sort of you know, pie in the sky dream one day. So I graduated, moved back to DC and was working for an education technology company. And like, listen, good company, good job. I was making decent money, but I couldn't get the idea of opening a pizza restaurant out of my head. Just like the idea grew bigger and bigger every day. So after two years of working for this company, just one night, I was like, I have to chase my dreams. Like I have to go do this. And so I started to look at like actual locations and I would tour the locations and they would be asking these questions. And like, I didn't even know what the questions meant. I definitely didn't know the answer. And I like, I didn't even know what the question was. So I was like, okay, I need like, what's a bite-sized way I can like dip my toes into the water uh, and came up with the mobile pizza oven. So it's, it's not quite a food truck, but we were pulling a wood fired oven behind like a 1967 Chevy C10 truck and just sort of like learning on the go you know, going to every farmer's market, any, like anybody who would have us anywhere, we would show up for two years and, you know, got pretty good at making pizza and really learning about sort of how important service and all that was. So that's 2014, opened our first pizza restaurant, June, 2016, and sort of just been off to the races ever since. Wow. Amazing. So how did you kind of come up with good pizza? As I said, I've been eating carbs my whole life. Um, so I had I had like a vision of what I wanted it to be. Like I really, like I love New York style, like deck oven pizza where it has the crispy bottom. But then I also love Neapolitan pizza. Like I love the char of, of the fire and I loved the fresh mozzarella. And I was like, why well, can't these two just like have a baby, right? So I was calling it Neapolitan-ish where it was cooked in a wood fired oven, but at a lower temperature. So it's crispy a la like a New York style pizza. And then we we're using like, um, you know, cheese blends like New York, but then fresh mozzarella, like a Neapolitan. So we just sort of, I had this vision of like, how can we combine the two? Then I just started reading a ton about dough and pizza and uh, just, just started doing recipe testing. I was, you know, 
I was doing this in my parents' back alley, um, which sometimes they enjoyed. Sometimes they're like, oh my God, what has our son done? Um, <laughs> but yeah, it worked out. So what was most, I mean, I'm sure you have a huge list, but what was most surprising to you as you got started in 2014 with your kind of your makeshift food truck type situation? Whew. What was most surprising? Um, I mean, on like the food level, right? Like I was not a chef. I had no chef background. I was learning all this on the fly. So how much temperature affects dough was like, I couldn't believe it. The first time, like it was a hot, you know, humid summer day and we opened up the dough and it was all overproof because when it's hot and humid, the yeast just goes nuts. I opened up the dough tray and was like, what the hell? Like I have soup here. So there was like a lot to learn on the food side, right? Um, which eventually we met my now wife and business partner, Danny. She came on as chef and really helped stabilize a lot of things. Um, but I think the other thing that I learned that I think I sort of like knew, but like really saw it was people don't go just to eat just for the food. It's like, it's an experience. And that's like from your first touch point to like how warm is the goodbye as you leave, right? And so even when we're selling pizza at a farmer's market, We'd have great tunes. We'd be dancing. Whoever's taking orders would be, you know, super friendly. When we're cutting the pizza, we're saying, have a great day, you know, Billy, all that stuff. So, you know, we like from the get go, it was really supposed to be like, a, you know, an experience, not just about the food. Was the experience and the food kind of your marketing or did you do other things besides, you know, obviously going and being the guy at the event or being the guy at the farmer's market is great, great marketing. But did you do anything broader than that or was it just kind of in that way? Yeah, I mean, that was like the lion's share of it for sure. Like I always said, the way we started was like marketing where you didn't lose money. So that was kind of cool where you'd actually be selling. Um, but then like, obviously we did a ton of social media stuff. Um, you know, back in 2014, a bunch of food trucks were like really taking off in DC. This was like when the whole food truck movement was exploding. Um, so we did like different collaborations with different food trucks just to get in front of different eyeballs. So like us just showing up and selling and being ourselves was definitely like 90% of it. Yeah. But then doing collaborations with other food businesses to try and get in front of other people and then really relying on um, Instagram and uh, a little bit of Facebook and Facebook's pretty much out now. But So you, you did that for two years and then um, your first brick and mortar came in 2016 with Timber Pizza Company. Uh, how, how did that go? You know, so we opened June 28th and I think we had like $3,000 in the bank and we knew we had payroll in two weeks. And I was like, we got to make money from day one. We don't have time to not be profitable. We got to figure this out now. And thank God it was busy out of the gates and it went really, really well for the first year. So the first year was great, right? And then, so we've been open about a year and then Bon Appetit comes out with their top 50 best new restaurants list. And we didn't even know this list was a thing. And then we were on it. And like overnight, our sales went up 40% sort of now sustained, you know, eight years later, whatever it is. So that really changed the game. So like the first year went great. And then it went sort of better than best case scenario after that for the second year. And that's what led us to be able to open more timbers. And then that led to us meeting our initial investor and business partner and call your mother and sort of us cooking up the call your mother dream. So when you opened up a, uh, a brick and mortar, did you have kind of a... I mean, obviously you already, you were already um, confident in your product and maybe, maybe your service, although I'm sure there was more service now that's brick and mortar. Um, did you have kind of a vision for the vibe or the, you know, how you wanted the place to feel and take me through what that was and is? Yeah. So I, 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 I can sort of envision the finished product before sometimes I even have like a name. Right. So I knew I wanted this, like the pizza restaurant, I wanted it to feel like summer camp in the Adirondacks. I don't know how I came up with that, but that was the vibe. So I wanted like tons of reclaimed wood and like a copper bar top and you know a bunch of tunes from like the late 90s when I was in middle school so I could like envision the experience where it's it's fun it's loud you order at the counter and then the food gets brought to you so it's not like too stuffy um you know server style and then I wanted everything to be communal so everything on the menu you can get for one or to share so you can get a cocktail and a bottle to share or as a one you can get the salads and solo portions are to share and then there was just picnic tables so you were like forced to sit next to your neighbors 
And it just led to this sort of like electric environment at the, um, you know, that first year where it was just like so fun and you're rubbing elbows and everything and everybody's sharing everything. So I uh, sort of saw that vision and then we sort of built around it to, to make it come to life. Were enough, when you first opened, were enough people aware of your brand because of, um, you know, the prior two years that it was not that big of a deal or did you have to make some um, yeah, it was like a little of both. Like we had built a decent following, but nothing like crazy. Um, you know, we had been doing basically farmers markets five days a week, hitting all different parts of the DC area. So we had an okay following, um, like Washington city paper ranked us one of the best three pizzas in DC. So we were like building a name for ourselves. Um, but then we definitely like, we, we had to build it more cause you know, sales that work out of a farmer's market are very different than sales that work out of a restaurant. So we definitely had to amp it up a little bit. Um, and, a, you know, most of our stuff has been organic, just getting on some cool lift, Washingtonian, putting us on like the top restaurant list, all that stuff. So I think in restaurants for sure, like the more organic the PR can be, the better. Um, and we were just very blessed to get on a lot of sort of cool organic lists and that helped sort of grow the clientele. I'm guessing that helps then when you opened other locations and people already knew about you. For sure. For sure. So then we had, you know, a brand name around timber in the, in the market. And so when we announced we were going to open call your mother, like before we even opened the sort of the reception to that was crazy where people were so excited. I think, you know, we built up a reputation making pretty good pizza. Let's see what these, what these cats can do when they do bagels. Um, and then we sort of followed the same exact game plan. So we sold at a farmer's market for basically a year before we opened the first brick and mortar, call your mother. And we could not make enough at the farmer's market. So we, you know, it sort of turned, it took on this life of its own. There was long lines, it was selling out. Um, and then we opened the first call your mother, October, 2018. And it was just bananas from day one, like lines down the block where we like looked at each other's each other and said oh shit like how are we going to make this many bagels um so then <laughs> it went from being like is anybody going to show up to like oh my god how are we going to like handle this many people and make this many bagels so yeah I, yeah i want to talk talk to you a little bit more about call your mother but how did you um you know i've eaten millions of pizzas pizza life love pizza but i i couldn't come up with like an award-winning pizza recipe how did you kind of develop that yeah, I mean, you know, I, I think it was, it started with that foundation of having like a, a crispy crust in that wood fired oven. And then it was just like not doing too much and using great ingredients. I think a lot of times people try and do too much. And I think part of the blessing is like we weren't chefs to start out with, right? So we weren't trying to make things too chef y. We we're just like, okay, <laughs> zucchini in season. I can wrap my head around that. What can we do with zucchini? And we'd like, keep things pretty simple and fresh and seasonal. And then being at all the farmers markets, you're just like rubbing elbows with the best farmers and purveyors in the markets. So you're like building these great relationships with them. And so, um, you know, I, I just walk down and I say, okay, what's in season? And they say, oh, we have the best, whatever, nectarines. And we're like, okay, let's put a nectarine on a pizza. Um, and we ended up doing a pizza with nectarine, jalapenos and bacon that sold like crazy. Um, so it was like keeping it simple using just great ingredients and then just, you know, trying to come up with some, some interesting combinations. Have you always had this un kind of entrepreneurial, uh, spirit, you know, most people feel like people who aren't entrepreneurs feel like they could never open a business cause they don't have everything figured out already. Have you always been like this? You know, like when I look back, it's sort it's like a sort of yes. Right. Like, so when I was in fourth grade, I remember making bracelets to sell in fourth grade, just like a little hustle. And then I remember doing like lemonade stands but then I sort of lost it for a while like I didn't do anything entrepreneurial in high school or college I think you sort of hear how hard it is and I think I said oh like maybe it's too hard I can't do that um and it actually took going to business school for me to get some of that like confidence and mojo back where I just had this moment where I was like nobody here knows what the f they're doing like we're all sort of trying to figure it out right and so I had this this moment where I was like if they can do it why can't I do it um, so I think it was like in me at like a young age, lost the confidence for, you know, eight to 10 years and then, then got the mojo back and went for it. So you, uh, you mentioned, um, obviously you, you also founded call your mother deli, I believe, um, in 2018. So that would have been two years after your first brick and mortar with timber, um, pizza. What, uh, how did you come up with that name? 
Yeah, sort of. So same like timber, I, I could see the vision, like the finished product. So growing up, my Jewish grandparents lived in Boca Raton. So we would go down there, you know, write pops of color. My grandparents were so fun. They loved like going out. And like, so it was, I knew I wanted it to be this like bright, fun, colorful restaurant that like didn't take itself too seriously. And I think a lot of sort of delis and bagel shops, they all sort of have the same feel. It's the white subway tiles. It's the somebody's last name. And so I was like, I just want this to be something totally different. And we struggled for a long time to come up with the name. We, we just like couldn't figure it out. So one night I was at my friend's house and I was like, what's something funny? Our Jewish grandmothers would have yelled at us. And somebody said, you should eat something. Put some meat on your bones. And then my friend's sister said, call your mother. And I was like, it was just like fireworks went off. And I was like, oh my God, that's it. It's fun. It's memorable. It's so like quintessentially Jewish, but it also spans all cultures, right? So my wife, who's the chef and business partner, she's from Argentina. She instantly got it. Her mom loves it. So I uh, just checked all the boxes and we went with it. So uh, you mentioned you wanted kind of a different vibe. What What is the vibe then at Call Your Mother Deli? Yeah, it's just, I'd say super fun, super playful, super nostalgic, right? So, you know, the the latte that we're coming out in the spring. So in a couple of weeks, we're coming out with a strawberry Pop-Tart latte. So it's like all flavors that are reminiscent of our childhood. So if you grew up in the 90s, like so many of these flavors are for you. The playlists are from the 90s. Um, lots of like classics with just like slight twists. So our bacon, egg and cheese has spicy honey on it. Just like little twists to like amp stuff up. Super nostalgic, super fun. Who came up? Who's coming up with all these ideas? I mean, almost everything is, is, is my wife and I. So, you know, originally at the very beginning, my wife and I, all we do is sort of live the brand. So it's, Everybody's always like, where do you find inspiration? I'm like, we spend all day, every day together. This is all we talk about. This is it. You know, we now have 13 locations and have an incredible team. So now we have a culinary team and, you know, all this stuff. So it's, um, uh, you know, now it's a whole team effort. But at the beginning, it was just my wife and I riffing, me helping with some recipes, her helping me in the front of house. So it was sort of like the total team effort. Is there one specific thing that you learned from doing the pizza business that you have taken with you now to call your mother that you probably that you know like oh if i hadn't known that i wouldn't nearly be as successful now with call your mother as i would have as you know i would be without it yeah i think some of it goes back to just like what i was talking about with like how do you make great pizza mm -hmm. is you know i think people hear like use the best local products and like some people can sort of like roll their eyes a little bit and like oh but it's so much easier to buy peaches from you know whatever the main broadliner is but truly, when you're sourcing like the best ingredients, it is that big of a difference, right? Like the peach that you buy for 10 cents from your broadliner versus like the best local ripe peach is the difference between like in holy shit experience and like, oh, that was pretty good. Um, and so that's been like, you know, we've tweaked a lot of stuff over the years. But one thing we've never cut corners on is quality of product and using the best seasonal products. So. So now between the two brands, how many locations do you have? So now we're at 12, 16 six, six, or 17. What is the, what's the biggest challenge that comes with, you know, obviously you, you started from nothing basically, and now you're at 17 locations. What's the biggest challenge now you, that you face now compared to then? Yeah. I mean, so like the first two years, Danny is my wife. We were in timber every single day. Like there was no chance we didn't know exactly what was happening and could control every aspect. And the same with the first couple of years of Call Your Mother. Now that's impossible, right? So like the biggest challenge is how do you maintain that magic? How do you continue to have great service and the best food? And it basically comes down to hiring incredible people, incentivizing them to want to grow and stay with you for a long time, um, and then creating just world-class systems, right? So you know, a good example is early on at Timber, we had a we had a pizza that had like golden brown sort of sauteed onions. And the recipe said golden brown sauteed onions. Now your golden brown is very different than my golden brown. So we're like, oh my God, we have to have a picture of exactly what golden brown is. So we have learned to remove all gray area, have great systems, just don't leave anything up for interpretation. Um, and then hire sort of incredible people and incentivize them to want to stick around and help improve the brand. What do you do? 
I was going to ask you about your culture. What what do you do to kind of keep people around, incentivize them? Uh, is there kind of a, a characteristic you're looking for when you hire great people? Yeah, I mean, it sort of depends on the position. Like at its core, we just want work to be fun every day. Like mm -hmm. this is a restaurant, you know, yes, we're trying to grow a big business, but we're not like, we're not, you know, curing cancer or anything. Like this should be fun every single day. So, you know, A, I think we pay above market, but that doesn't matter if you're not having fun every single day, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then we try and throw sort of as many perks as we can that make sense. So free gym membership, we offer free language classes, and then we do this, like the 401k and health insurance and all that, which is not typical in restaurants. Um, and then we just like try and create tons of growth opportunities. So, you know, a good example is we had a guy who was in our baking team who then wanted to get into accounting and switched over to the accounting team. So we really like, if there's something here you want to do and you're going to work hard, we're going to figure out how to sort of help you on your career path and make your dreams come true. So, um, but as I said, the, the number one thing is it has to be fun. If this is what you're going to be doing five days a week, majority of your time, you got to like, like your coworkers, you got to have fun or else all the other perks don't really matter. Uh, as I as you mentioned, you you got an MBA. Your your journey is a little different than a lot of people I talk to. You know, they started out as a busboy in high school or something, and then they just stayed in the restaurant industry. What what uh did you take away from that MBA that you might that helped your success so far that you might not have had if you hadn't gotten that degree? Yeah, I think like hard skills, almost none. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I, I think as I was saying earlier, I think it just gave me a confidence, right? Like I sort of going through college, I don't know, they're just like, there's, I was never a great student. Let's start there. So mm -hmm. you're always sort of on the backside of the class and not good at your homework. You can like sort of lose confidence. And in grad school, you know, kudos to Fordham. It's not like a ton of like homework. It's more fun projects. And can you come up with a business? And so I think part of that, I was just in my realm. And then I just had this moment where I was like, I'm just as good as all of these people. So I think what grad school did was sort of give me my my swagger back. Um, and, you know, I did it teach me how to read a P&L better than I would have otherwise. Sure. But like I probably could have learned that on YouTube without going into all that student debt. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, outside of that, there's not like a ton of hard skills I learned, but I wouldn't trade it for anything because I was in New York for two years, was getting inspired by the restaurant scene there. And then... Um, you know, just get my, get my confidence back. And here we are. Yeah. Just a couple more questions for you. What has been, has there ever, was there ever a point where you were like, uh, I don't think this is going to work out, uh, in your journey It's maybe towards the beginning or were you always, was it always going pretty well and you were just doing your thing? You know, like I'd say year one where it was just the mobile business, it was hard to see how this could turn into like a real career. Cause we were, grinding like grind 80 hour weeks and there just like wasn't enough revenue to make it like a real career and so there was a couple of times the first year I was like Jesus like how are we going to turn this into like something where we can actually make real money um you know and then the first year of the actual restaurant as I said day one I was like we have to make money today or this is going to close or this is going to be the shortest opened restaurant of all time <laughs> and so there might have been like two days where i was like oh shit like holding on to our chair like we need to you know hit sales but then we were like pretty blessed for a long sort of stretch obviously early pandemic i thought everything was going down the toilet i remember standing outside my mom's house me at the bottom of the steps her at the top Cause you know, you wouldn't go near anybody. And I was just saying, well, you know, we had a good four year run. I guess I got to go figure out something else to do. Um, but after feeling sorry for ourselves for a couple of weeks, we, we sort of got back in the saddle and, and everything worked out. How did the, how, as long as you mentioned that, how did the pandemic, did, did it affect your business? Did it change your business? That Are there still changes that you implemented as a result of it? How did that affect you? Yeah. You know, it actually, actually forced us to get much more efficient. So pre pandemic, we did no online ordering. Um, we just, for call your mother, it was order in person and that's it. And that timber is order in person or call on the phone, old school style. Um, and we thought we were sort of maxed out on throughput. And, you know, during COVID, if you didn't take online orders, you were just going to die a painful death. So we said, <laughs> okay, we got to figure this out. And uh, it forced us to get much more efficient, made us realize that we could actually do way more throughput. Um, 
And then as the world slowly, you know, opened up and we were doing in person and online, we realized we could handle it. So it actually helped us realize we could do way more in sales without hurting sort of the product quality or the service. So, um, you know, insane to say that one of the worst things ever was actually kind of good for our business in the long run, but it did force us to get much better and more efficient. What advice would you give to aspiring entrepreneurs in the hospitality industry? I, you know, I think there's like two main things is don't rush the process, right? Like I see so many people who they start a business and they want to fast forward to sitting in the C-suite, not grinding. And I think those first couple of years, you just, you have to grind. You have to be in it. I'd say a new business is like a newborn baby that needs constant love and attention. Like maybe down the line, it can take care of itself a little bit, but at the beginning, don't rush to be the boss and sit in the back office, like know every single aspect of your business, be super duper hands-on because nobody's going to care as much as, as you do. So that's like the, the don't rush the process is like really be in it. And then the other thing like is just outwork people like, and that's it. So when we started Timber as a mobile truck, we started out of a food incubator. So there's a bunch of other food trucks starting at the same time. And I would say every other food truck had more experienced chefs, better funding, you know, all that stuff, but they didn't work as hard as we did. They would say, oh, you know, I'm going to take this weekend off because I want to go to the beach or oh, I don't want to work a double today where we were just like, okay, we're going to show up every single day for two years and good things will eventually start to happen. So don't rush the process and just outwork everybody else and you'll be surprised what can happen. Nice. Very nice. Hey, I have one more question for you, but first, how can people find out more about both places? Call Your Mother Deli and Timber Pizza Company. Yeah. I mean, Call Your Mother Deli, that's our Instagram handle. CallYourMotherDeli.com is our website. Same Timber Pizza Co. is our Instagram handle. And then Timber Pizza uh, is our website. Get on our emailing list. Our Instagrams are pretty fun. Check us out in DC. And then in Call Your Mother, we're also in Denver now. So we got three locations in Denver. Check us out. Oh, nice. Very nice. Um, so last question for you. When you are a customer at either one of those places, do you have like go-to items? For sure. So with Timber, it's like I ate pizza every day for the first 90 days we were open. And then I had to have a little sit down with myself. <laughs> Easy big guy. So I've been like every pizza on the menu has been my favorite at some point, but now I'm in like a very basic, I just like cheese pizza or margarita pizza. I like it very basic. Um, so that's kind of boring. And then on the uh, on the bagel menu, there's really two. There's the Grand Villa. So it's a cinnamon raisin bagel, peanut butter, jelly with homemade peanut butter granola. So it's like a big kid's peanut butter and jelly with the crunch of the granola. It's incredible. And then if I'm more of in a lunch mood, we have the Grandeza, which is basically a turkey melt with fresh mozzarella, pesto, and red, uh, red pepper relish. Woo! Sounds pretty good. Sounds glorious. Hey, uh, Andrew, it's been great to talk to you today. Thanks so much for all of your time, your thoughts, your insights, your stories. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Anytime. So long, everybody. Thanks for listening to the Top Business Leaders Show, powered by Rise25. Visit rise25.com to check out more episodes of the show and to learn more about how you can start your own podcast.